Hello and welcome to another MSFS review today with the Gimbal Cabri G2 French built piston engined helicopter. The Cabri was conceived by former Eurocopter engineer Bruno Gimbal and that's why it features a seven bladed fenestrant tail rotor which is rather unusual for small training aircraft. The three bladed main rotor spins in a clockwise direction which is typical for French built helicopters and means that we will have to use our right anti torque pedal as the power pedal. Looks are just amazing, there's nothing more to say. I'm not too familiar with this helicopter, however, I have seen it around and this rendition seems to be spot on. Maybe a little bit too shiny, but then again, it is brand new, isn't it? I've just downloaded a real-life G2 checklist. I'm going to follow it along for a complete run-up to see how deep the simulation really is. One thing to notice is the extreme drooping of the main rotor blades. So while the fenestron actually reduces the danger of people running into the tail rotor, there is a considerable danger of people running into the main rotor, so you have to be extra careful to keep everyone well clear of the helicopter when you start the engines. Inside the aircraft, everything looks neat and tidy, very high quality texturing. The Cabri features a special instrument, the EPM, the Electronic Pilot Monitor. This is basically a small flight computer showing you the most vital information about your aircraft in a very condensed and practical way. It also features the MLI, which is short for Multi-Limit Instrument or Indicator. More on that later. Other than that, we have our standard gauges, the Turn and Slip Indicator, our Magnetic Compass with a backup up here, the Altimeter, the Airspeed Gauge on the right hand side, an Artificial Horizon the vertical speed indicator, and even an OBS for navigation. There is also a small GPS unit that you can operate via a touchscreen and buttons. Let me pull up the checklist real quick and I'm going to walk you through a complete startup procedure. Not too important in a simulator, but of course in real life, make sure that your seat belts are fastened. Also ensure that there are no loose objects uh, rolling around on the ground or inside the aircraft. Just imagine a water bottle rolling into the chin bubble blocking the paddles, that would be an actual emergency. That's not a problem in the sim, of course, we do not have any objects that we can take along. Not yet, I might say, who knows what uh, the future will bring. Controls check, deflect the paddles to the max and make sure there are no obstructions felt. Very nice detail, there's actually a sound when you move the controls. Collective all the way up and down again, check for any obstructions. Not implemented in the sim, but usually you can apply frictions to helicopter controls, allowing you to lock or secure them in place, or make them a little harder to move. The latter is sometimes used by pilots to increase the handling feel on hydraulically boosted aircraft. I'm gonna do uh, circles on my cyclic. There's one thing that is still weird to me, as you can see, if I put my cyclic into the extreme lateral position, it suddenly jolts. Uh, quite quickly to either side. There it is. It seems like I have some curve set on the x-axis, however, I do not see that in my controls menu. Seeing as we're flying a helicopter, we will not need these extreme deflections of the cyclic unless something goes horribly wrong. But it's still weird to me, so if any of you guys has an idea of what's going on here, let me know in the comments. It doesn't happen when I apply after forward cyclic, so the y-axis is okay. But the x-axis, see, slow, and all of a sudden, bam. I noticed the same thing with the Bell 407, but uh, so far it didn't really bother me while flying, so that's okay. So our controls are checked. Now we need to take a look at the panel in the back, make sure that all circuit breakers are in. They are inoperable, so they are defaulted in. Anyway, it would have been nice if they actually worked. Also make sure that the fuel shut-off valve is closed, should be in the 12 o'clock position, pointing upwards. You can take a look at the hops meter or hour meter, which basically shows you how many hours the engine has run. Here it shows less than half an hour. I only took out the Cabri once for a very short flight a couple of days ago. Up here is the emergency beacon, which starts transmitting should you have an accident. Hopefully that's not going to happen. You can test uh, the ELT. Don't forget to rearm it. Next on the checklist, uh, Collective is down and Altimeter is set. MSFS seems to automatically set the Altimeter to Field Elevation. I can probably change that in the settings. Now we'll check that all switches are in the off position, except for the carb heat switch. 
all off. Make sure that the clutch is off as well. And the carb heat switch is supposed to be in the auto position, in the automatic mode. I'm about to start the battery or master switch. What will happen is that the EPM module goes into self-test mode and it will acknowledge the uh, completion of the test by sounding a horn. Take some time to load up. You see the gimbal logo and uh, the number of the installed software version. Very soon we will hear the horn and a status page. All columns should read okay, perfect. All right, let's have a look at the EPM. On the right-hand side is the dual tech showing us the engine RPM on the inner scale, the small blue needle, and the rotor RPM on the outer scale, which is the large white needle. Down here are T's and P's, short for temperatures and pressures. And on the left-hand side is the MLI, a multi-limit indicator. If you're familiar with Eurocopter helicopters, they call this an FLI, the first limit indicator. Maybe FLI is copyright protected, so Gimbal had to call it MLI, I don't know. Either way, it works the same way. It shows you a scale, which is basically a combination of different uh, values and parameters. And it shows you the margin between your power request as a pilot and the first present limitation on the engine. Simply put, it shows you how much engine power you have available. The blue column is fuel. You have information about your electric supply and the outside air temperature. Very similar to Eurocopter's VEMD system. One thing that doesn't work or is not implemented is the NR switch that lets us test the caution lights. You would put it into the backup position. You would check that all lights except the starter light would illuminate. That's weird because testing the caution warning lights should be part of every aircraft's pre-flight checklist. We're gonna have to skip the caution lights. What also is not simulated is the deeper structure of the EPM. It should have uh, several sub pages that you can click through. I can hear the sounds when I click those buttons, but nothing happens. Now check that the governor is off. The switch is on the top of the collective. It can be a little bit hard to find the click spot though. A governor takes over throttle control for the pilot, maintaining sufficient rotor RPM at all times. In helicopters without a governor, such as the Bell 47 or Schweitzer 300, you would have to manually throttle the aircraft yourself. Check out my review of the fly inside Bell 47 for more information. I didn't find a click spot for the starter, which is also supposed to be on top of the collective. See the blue governor off light on. Uh, so I had to assign a button to the starter. I'm going to make sure that the mixture is full rich all the way forward. Piston engines use oxygen to burn fuel. As we gain altitude, there's a decrease in atmospheric pressure, causing the air to expand and become less dense. This leaves less oxygen for the engine to burn, so we have to reduce the fuel flow by use of the mixture lever to not use any engine power. Before any part of your aircraft starts to move, activate the strobe light or anti-collision light. You can see it blinking on the uh, tail fin here. Next step is switching on the fuel pump. On activation, we will check for an increase in fuel pressure. That's uh, the gauge on the lower right hand side of the EPM. And we can see the pressure rising. All good. The checklist now mentions manual injection. This is probably not simulated and that's okay. Manual injection simply means priming the engine, which can be necessary with very low outside air temperatures. The way this is done is you would open up the throttle all the way. A little blue arrow on the MLI will show you your throttle position. And one manual injection would be raising the collective all the way up to 100% and then lowering it back again. You might have to do this up to five times, uh, depending on the outside uh, conditions. Uh, today it's about 50 degrees outside, so we probably wouldn't need to prime the engine in the first place. After priming, you will close the throttle almost all the way. It will remain open just a tad bit. So much for the real aircraft. I'm not sure whether or not engine priming is actually necessary to fire this bird up in icy conditions. Maybe you guys have already tried. Let me know in the comments. Almost there, check the rotor brake. Go to the overhead panel, pull down on the rotor brake lever and make sure the brake caution light is illuminated. It should be on the main panel. There it is, sorry. Disengage rotor brake, make sure the brake light is off. Next step is a fuel mixture to rich a second time, we already did that. Mixture should be full rich, close to the ground, close to sea level. As you gain altitude, you would adjust the mixture lever for best uh, engine performance. Back to the overhead panel, activate magnetos, which will create sparks for our reciprocating engine. Now switch on the Cabri's own plasma ignition system, which not only sounds festive, it apparently also increases engine output by a couple of HPs. 
or so I read. I have no idea how this works. Now finally ready to start the engine. We will see the starter light come on. Hopefully the engine will start. And within 30 seconds we should have enough oil pressure so the oil pressure light goes out. Make sure the anti-collision light is set to on, the cyclic is centered, and that there's nobody in the danger zone around the helicopter. Highway to the... Engine start. Our pressure light is off. We will let it stabilize for a little while. We can see the small needle on the dual tech showing us the engine RPM. The big needle, that's the rotor RPM, that's still at 0% seeing as we haven't engaged the clutch yet. Now switching on the alternator, giving us electrical power and recharging the battery at the same time. Make sure the alternator light is out. Before engaging the clutch, I'm going to roll on the throttle until engine RPM is at about 1000 can be a little bit tricky, there's quite a lag between your uh, control inputs and the RPM actually reacting. Once the rotors are up and running, I'm going to do a number of tests which will actually show whether or not a Sobo did go the extra mile regarding simulation depth of their Cabri G2, so that's going to be interesting. Engage the clutch and listen for the sound, it's lovely. Now the two needles on the dual tack should converge, the large rotor RPM needle catching up with the smaller engine RPM needle. Once they're superimposed or married, uh, the clutch light should go out, meaning that the clutch is fully engaged. Now we can further increase the throttle until engine RPM is at 2000 for the magnetos and plasma test. Alright, that's close enough. I'm going to switch off the plasma on the overhead, which will lead to a decrease in engine RPM. What we are looking for is that engine RPM is not dropping more than 300 in 5 seconds. Alright, we do see a decrease in RPM and certainly not more than 300. Perfect, we can reactivate the plasma now. Now I would expect the RPM to rise again, which they sort of don't. So I'm going to use the throttle to uh, put the RPM back to 2000. Now if you wonder what those T's and P's are, it's the carburetor temperature, the cylinder head temperature, the oil temperature, oil pressure and fuel pressure, and each T stands for exhaust gas temperature, showing you how hot your exhaust gases are. Now for the magneto test, switch off magnetos via the overhead panel. Count to 5 and make sure that engine RPM have not dropped more than 100. I don't see much happening here. It's also hard to tell because I don't have a numerical display of the engine RPM, only of the rotor RPM. Magneto and plasma ignition switches are definitely simulated. Not much reaction uh, when deactivating the magneto switch though, but uh, you know, every machine is different. So let's reactivate the magnetos. And yet we do see an increase in RPM. Let's try this again. I will switch off the plasma ignition. Yep, we see a drop in RPM. Switch it back on. And the RPMs climb again. So very well done, the Sobo. Now we will set the rotor speed between 400 and 450. Notice the yellow low RPM light is illuminated, just left of the EPM. Now switching off the fuel pump, making sure that the fuel pressure remains. Still got pressure, fuel pump back to on. For testing the carb heating, we will increase RPM to about 530. Notice the low NR light now blinking, and it should turn green once the needles are in the green band on the dual tack gauge. There we go. Now we'll test the carburetor heating. We will put the carb heat switch from auto into hot mode. Now we are looking for a slight drop in RPM, and there should be an additional yellow square where it reads heat, indicating that the heating was turned up a notch. Nothing really happening. Right, there's nothing. Let's switch the carb heat into cold mode. 
fan in the opposite direction actually works, so the car heat temperature goes down and the RPMs go up. So I tried it a second time, there's no reaction whatsoever when the switch is in the hot position. However, maybe there is an explanation for this. It might have something to do with the outside, uh, weather conditions, or it's a bug. I don't know. Let me know in the comments if uh, anybody has in-depth knowledge of this helicopter. Last test is the needle split. We're going to roll off the throttle and we're looking for a needle split, meaning that the engine RPM is going down while the rotor keeps freewheeling, spinning. That's very important for an auto rotation. As you can see, it's exactly what happens here. If it should be slippery outside or you're on icy ground, you uh, should be careful with rolling off the throttle. You might have to give opposing pedal input so the helicopter does not move on the ground. So now we're finally ready to go. We're going to activate the governor. It's hard to find the click spot. Once it is active, we can see that the blue governor light is off. And uh, once we get past 400 RPM, the governor should take over, increasing RPM until it is way in the green band. There he goes, the governor increasing our RPM. So the helicopter is now in flight idle. We are ready to go. So now would be the time to program your GPS if you haven't already done that. You could contact the CTAF frequency of Bella Coola advising your intentions. And you can switch on additional lights that you might need, such as the navigation lights or position lights. You don't need those. It's bright daylight and visibility is good. So before lift off, a final check of our T's and P's. No caution lights should show. The only light that we want to see is the green and our light. All right, let's get going. Be sure to turn the helicopter assist options off if you want to have a realistic experience. Now we will anticipate a little bit of a right anti-torque pedal, the power pedal. And the cyclic will be displaced a little bit to the right due to translating tendency and a little bit aft of center. Now slowly increase collective until you feel the aircraft is getting light on its skid, so it's just about to lift off in the air. And that's the time where you would do corrective repositioning of your cyclic. So you can find the helicopter's hovering sweet spot, which slightly changes depending on the aircraft's center of gravity and wind. In this case, I see the helicopter's nose rise, so I have to push forward on the stick a little bit. Also notice how the nose of the helicopter yawed to the right a bit, meaning that I was using just a tad bit too much of right pedal. Now, while I have to say that I found the Belt 407 a little bit disappointing in its uh, handling characteristics, I have to say that I really like this Cabri. It's responsive yet very stable and easy to fly. As you witness, the starter procedure was very true to life. Simulation goes quite deep. Now, if they would want to make it perfect, they could give us a complete simulation of the EPM as well as the NR switch. And they should include functioning circuit breakers. After all, there are not too many of them in this aircraft. Notice how I have to keep the Cabri in a right skid low attitude in order to fly straight and not drift to the left due to an effect called translating tendency. If the main rotor of a helicopter spins in a clockwise motion such as in the Cabri, you can expect a right skid low attitude during a hover. If the main rotors of a helicopter spin in an anti-clockwise direction such as in the Belt 407, you can expect it to hover left skid low. You need to be very active on the anti-torque pedals to maintain directional control. And unlike what I experienced with the Bell 407, the Cabri actually simulates torque-induced yaw very well. I'll show you what I mean. I will maintain my current deflection of the anti-torque pedals while increasing collective. Pulling more power increases torque effect, making the helicopter yaw to the left. More right or power pedal input is needed to maintain directional control. Now I need to gain a little more altitude to show you the opposite effect. This time I'm going to maintain the deflection of my anti-torque pedals while lowering the collective. Less power means less torque effect, so less right power pedal is needed. I would have to ease off on the right pedal, but since I'm keeping it the way it was, you can see that the nose of the helicopter actually turns to the right. This fundamental principle of helicopter flight was, in my opinion, not very well implemented into Nemeth Design's Bell 407. However, the Cabri does a very good job here. Now, I chose Bella Coola Airport for this video for reasons of comparison. There is a very nice Bella Coola payware scenery for X-Plane, a beautiful rendition with very accurate buildings and a heliport that seems to be missing in MSFS. We're flying straight towards it, actually. Now, for my fellow X-Plane pilots, if you know that scenery, you can see 
that MSFS's uh, default scenery can actually very well compete with those high quality scenery products for X-Plane. Now, don't get me wrong, I love X-Plane for its flight dynamics and functionality. However, visually, that's what they're up against. And keep in mind that you're watching MSFS on a rather poor rig right now. All right, for a smooth touchdown, maintain a stable hover, right skid low, and slowly reduce collective. Keep in mind that you will have to ease off on the right pedal as you do so, and feel for the ground with the right skid. Once it touches, smoothly reduce collective a little bit more until you're safe and solid on the ground. There we are. This concludes the first part of my Gimbal G2 Cabri review. In part two, maybe I'm doing some traffic patterns or a short VATSIM flight. I don't know yet. However, we will take a closer look at the flight dynamics of the Cabri. I hope you enjoyed this little video. If you did, give me a thumbs up and subscribe. And definitely leave me a comment on the Gimbal G2 Cabri helicopter in MSFS 2020. Later.